gentlemen, great to have you along for the ride today. Always a pleasure to visit with Kelly Church. I have enjoyed knowing him for 25 years, and whenever you do an interview with him, the time flies. You always think to yourself, man, I wish I had more time on that. Yeah. Very and, fascinating and a, guy. And a better mentor than he is a coach. And, and, he's, and he's a, a great coach. coach. Yeah, absolutely. Via telephone, Michelle Suddeth, Executive Director for CASA of the Eastern Panhandle. Michelle, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Great to have you with us. It's been a little while since we've spoken with you. I'd like to, if you could, uh, reestablish what CASA is and does first before we get into uh, different parts of the conversation. So if you could take the lead on that. Oh, for sure. Um, well, unfortunately, we are way too busy. Um, uh, CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates, and our bread and butter is pairing volunteers in the community uh, to active abuse and neglect cases uh, in Jefferson, Morgan, and Berkeley counties. Right now, there are probably six to 700 active open abuse and neglect cases um, and we are able to serve about half of them. So we're always looking for volunteers. We're always looking for solutions. And we've expanded programs to really bring in more staff uh, to deal with some of the special populations like youth aging out of foster care. So, How does a volunteer get started with CASA and what's involved in being trained and brought up to speed? Well, COVID has, uh, you know, really helped us innovate and transform our training. So um, the first step is going to www.mycasaet.org, learning more about us, calling our office, and talking to someone about what it takes to be a volunteer. But in a nutshell, it is um, approximately 20 to 30 hours of training, which, as I kind of said, um, because of COVID, it is flexible. We do uh, virtual. We do hybrids where it's some in the office, some online. And after this intense training, uh, we have our volunteers observe what happens in the courtroom. They're paired with a volunteer supervisor who has their back on all these cases, but they learn how to be an advocate for these children, how to speak up for them in the courtroom, um, how to provide resources to the family and um to themselves in terms of future planning for their lives and what happens after foster care. So it's a really important role. We know a lot about resiliency. We know what it takes for kids who've experienced trauma to survive it. And uh, number one on that list is there is one person in their life. And whether it's a teacher, it's a coach, it's a CASA, this person makes all the difference in the world. Do you function at all under DHHR in the state of West Virginia? Uh, we work very closely with DHHR. Um, they share, uh, they obviously are part of the team that manages these cases. Uh, the reason I started off by saying we're way too busy is uh, because of all the challenges with DHHR, certainly the staffing challenges in the panhandle, um, we have had to take over a lot of the work that would normally fall to DHHR workers. But at this point, um, we're seeing some movement that we have new people starting, uh, new people getting trained, but it has been really a struggle to not have people on the ground. Let me uh, go to Delegate Mike Height now, who has a bit of first-hand knowledge with DHHR. Michael? Good morning, Michelle. How are you? Hold on a second, Mike. Can we get your mic up correctly? Am I, am I one now? Yes. Sir. Good morning, Michelle. How are you? I'm great. Nice to talk to you. You too. So tell me a little bit. You say there's about four or 500 cases currently. Um, do you see those cases increasing um, now or decreasing or staying about the same? What's the status of that? Well, at the moment, they're increasing. And um, I, I think it's, we need to take a step back and look at why they're increasing. I think part of the reason we weren't on track, at least to where we were last year, uh, in terms of filing of these abuse and neglect cases, is DHHR couldn't do the investigations that would bring them in front of the court. So while in the earlier in the year we were seeing decreases, it's not that the abuse and neglect problem was solved, it's that these cases weren't being investigated and these families weren't getting the resources they need. So, you know, that was, that's the problem. And do you see that that being fixed with through DHHR now? Now we see the numbers increasing again, right? Because there's feet on the ground, there's people on the ground visiting homes and um, you know following up on 
suspected abuse and neglect call. And if an individual wanted to volunteer and be part of CASA, what, what would they expect um, to be uh, a general case, per se? Well, um, you know, uh, abuse and neglect cases span the gamut in terms of the ages of the children. So we could go from zero to 18 in terms of the ages of the kids. The majority of our cases have um, a parent or family me- member with substance use disorders. Um, and what they would expect on assignment is they go to MDTs where status reports are given. Uh, CASAs are required to visit the children in the home, the foster care home, um, the kinship placement, to see how the kids are doing. And um, their big role in this is to report out on this. So because of the system challenges uh, in place and the amount of cases that caseworkers have and guardian at Leidens have, those are attorneys that represent the child, um, all of these people are depending on CASA because we're the only ones who have eyes on the child. So while we require once a month, these CASAs are really putting eyes on it, on the child much more than that. And more importantly, they're seeing the child, but they're talking to the teacher. And those are big um you know, we learn a lot from how the children are doing in school. We also, because we're court appointed, we have access to all the health care data, mental health care data. So ACASA really is doing this investigation on the case and developing a relationship with the child that really no one else has time for in the system. And once a child uh, gets into the system and becomes part of CASA, um, do you have them all the way to their 18th birthday or is there some way for uh, them to get out of the system um, yeah. before that? We hope not. Um, th- we hope not because, again, the whole goal is permanency. So the court, by law, uh, must, uh, you know, fast track these kids to permanency. And what, whether that means reunification, which is always everyone's first choice, right? We want the kids in their family. We know the outcomes will be better if they get back to their parents. That's first choice. If that can happen, then, um, you know, we need to kind of quickly find uh, an appropriate permanent placement with them. And we hope that's adoption. Um, Again, not every child can be that lucky to be adopted. So unfortunately, there are youth um, who have been in the system a decade or more. Um, And Those are the kids that we prioritize because they need the most help. Um, So on average, in terms of the CASA volunteers role, we like uh, to have CASAs commit to at least two years of service for CASA so they could take the case from opening to closing. So that's kind of the requirement. On average, cases last two to three years. Again, because of kind of the over, that the system's overwhelmed, uh, cases are open much longer. So you know, that's a difficult thing because we're asking volunteers to make longer term commitments. But really, we're asking people to be committed to a case from beginning to end until that child reaches permanency. Many CASAs will want to stay involved with their child and keep in touch in the families. The adopted families are open to that. Some families just prefer to close that chapter of their lives and kind of move on. Um, so it really depends on the family. At that point, we respect whatever the family wants to do in terms of ongoing communication. And then what's what's the turnover rate for your volunteers? It would seem to me like this kind of scenario would, would wear on them and, and they wouldn't want to do this for long periods of time. Is that the case? Yeah, well, that's really, I mean, the, we've had, we have volunteers who've been with, with us. We've, we just gave an award for someone who's been a volunteer for 16 years. So um, we have people who have, I mean, have been here as long as I have, which is going on six years. Uh, but for sure, we have a turnover rate. So um, I think last year we recruited 25 volunteers and we lost 20. So um, as maybe you, you know, huh, you see billboards along the side. We do a lot of uh, advertising, promotion, recruiting. Um, it, I spend a whole lot of time trying to do this. But equally important is retention and how we keep um, our volunteers supported energized. We think about their mental health. We just swore in uh, a couple volunteers yesterday, and this was um, Judge Redding gave uh, the new volunteers a big pep talk. You know, he said this is going to be hard, but, you know, figure out um, who to talk to, 
you know, the volunteers can only talk to each other because of confidentiality. So find a CASA buddy, uh, go get a manicure, pedicure was his, his advice for wellness. So it really is important that our CASA volunteers take care of themselves, talk to each other, and get the support they need from the staff people who are trained to support them. So I think we've, we've come a long way in thinking about ret- retention and self-care, and uh, we're going to continue to do better. And as we always say, recruitment starts, um, retention starts at recruitment. So we want to make sure that volunteers are clear-eyed about what it means to be a CASA volunteer and to make sure they're kind of ready for this challenge, um, which people say being a CASA volunteer, you know, and they think about their life. We have a lot of retirees who are CASA volunteers. It's one of the most challenging things I've ever done, but also the most rewarding. And uh, so I want to be sure to, to give that uh, side of this story when we talk about retention and even recruitment, because there's nothing like uh, seeing uh, families reunified, a child getting a full scholarship to college, um, someone who uh, was hospitalized as a diabetic who has a CASA who's a nurse who helps them figure out a nutrition plan that really transforms their day-to-day life. So I see these success stories every day. So I also want to make sure that people understand, you know, this is a hopeful business. I mean, we really do make a difference, um, along with dealing with a lot of things no one ever wants to see. John Doyle. Yeah, hi, Michelle. John Doyle here. Uh, I was in the legislature a number of years ago when the CASA program was created. And I remember it was uh, then Supreme Court Justice Margaret Workman that was the driving force behind persuading the legislature to, to create it. And you've talked about the volunteers you have. Uh, what size of a, of a staff do you have? Uh, we now have almost 10 people. And so in five years, we've gone from two to 10 Uh, We've had a lot of growth, a lot of support from the community. Um, You know, the state has been very supportive. We we had a federal grant that decreased our funding, and the state supplemented it. So we're very grateful for state support. Our community has really stepped up. Uh, Corporate sponsorships keep uh, keep us uh, with unrestricted funds to do a lot of expansion work. Uh, Places like the Seeley Foundation, Procter & Gamble, um, all United Way, all really big supporters of CASA. So, you know, I say to people, if you can't um, volunteer, please think about donating because we have capacity to expand and we really could serve all kids who need a CASA with a CASA volunteer. A couple of structural questions because the legislature has made some major changes both in the court system around here and in. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Resources, which will no longer exist uh, as of July 1. Uh, When our local circuit, judicial circuit, divides into two, how will that affect the structure of CASA? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the circuit, the court, since we serve the three counties, uh, we're that is not going to make a big difference in terms of our work. We're still serving all the three counties. We will uh, serve all the children who are before the court in those judicial, uh, whatever the judicial number is, if they are in our counties, we are going to serve those children. Um, In terms of the CHHR split, um, you know, to us, it's a wait and see. Uh, What we care about, I, I mean, I realize their leadership changes. People are hopeful. The state has obviously spent time and money in making sure uh, that this reorg uh, makes sense. But uh, what we care about is um, are the policies, the procedures, the human, the new human resource strategies that are going to keep workers on the ground and engaged and that the system itself speeds up so that cases can move along quicker and that resources are given to these families as soon as possible. I mean, prevention is a big thing. So time is of the essence, and we need people on the ground. So I have no idea when, when that's all, when we're going to see the change on the ground. But I hope we see a change on the ground, that this isn't just a chess move on a leadership, because a lot more has to change.
I think you will see a change on the ground for the positive. I certainly hope you will. Uh, I was an advocate for at least 20 years of breaking DHHR up, uh, and I'm happy they finally did it. I do, I do think it'll be uh, a more uh, efficiently functioning uh, set of agencies now that, that they're not all grouped together. And, and in many cases, they're agencies that didn't really fit together very well. So, yeah. And so what you're saying is there won't be two different CASAs here like there'll be two different circuits. There won't be a CASA for Jefferson County and a CASA for Berkeley and Morgan like the judicial circuits will will be uh, on July 1. No. Okay, we, thank uh, you. We are one, we are one CASA. Okay, okay. Yeah. How many are there around the state? There are 10 p- programs total. Okay. And uh, we have a West Virginia CASA that uh, kind of like an association that supports the work of these 10 organizations. Uh, Shanna Gray works out of Charleston, you know, really is li- liaison to the state. And um, she's been funded to think about expansion throughout the state. state. So uh, hopefully she is expanding her presence in Charleston. And hopefully if we have more CASAs throughout the state. We need them. Okay. On our Facebook page, Erica Roque posted a question asking, what percentage of kids end up reunited with their families? Michelle, do we know that? Uh, I'd say less than uh, 25%. Oh, that low. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm. You know, I think um, I think what we're, yeah, I mean, it runs 25 to 30%. Uh, as as I talked about substance use disorders and uh, parents are put on reunification periods and it is just a struggle. It is just a struggle for people dealing with substance use disorders. Is the, uh, the issues in the Eastern Panhandle, Michelle, are they similar to the issues around the state or that other states are having as well? Or are some of them more uh, unique? Well, as you all probably know, Berkeley County got, uh, it was really hard, hard hit with the opioid epidemic. I think they were number one for statewide deaths due to opioids. Um, so, uh, I, in terms of why people are in care and how quickly we can get them to reunify, I think our county is one of the most challenged challenged by the opioid epidemic. Um, I think it's all across the state. Obviously, West Virginia was hard hit, but Berkeley County in particular and Jefferson County, people don't want to, you know, really see that this goes on in Jefferson County, but we see higher rates of abuse and neglect now happening in Jefferson County. And um, same with Morgan. It's a real issue, the opioid epidemic in our county. Is there a, an, uh, an educated estimate on the underreporting of neglect cases that wind up with you? In other words, if we have uh, uh, one case that's reported, does that mean that there's three unreported? Uh, yeah, I don't really have an educa- educated guess on that. I mean, we always talk about Morgan County having higher rates of unreported cases. Um, so I, without doing some research, I wouldn't know off the top of my head. We also, um, you know, again, I talked about the gap of even, uh, you know, someone calling in with suspected abuse and neglect and then getting that case investigated. That's another area where I know, you know, we're, we're not kind of taking care of these families who um, actually have been identified and need some resources. So, more than the underreporting, I'd like us and even CASA to think more about how we deal with those families in that gap, right? We haven't, t- you know, the kids have not been removed yet. What could we do to support that they stay in their home? Michelle, you say you, you only um, get about half of the cases that are actually out there. What happens to the other half of those, uh, those children? Um, are they just get no representation at all? Well, they have a guardian at litem. So the state appoints uh, a, a lawyer for the child whose job it is to, is to represent the best interest of the child. So that attorney isn't about the parents. They're not about the state. Uh, they're about the child. The issue is we don't have enough guardian at litem. So um, while ACASA has one case, the guardian at litem has 100. So, you know, best hearted guardian at litem out there can't put eyes on the child in the situation. So we want everyone to have a CASA. Um, Because we don't have enough volunteers, we cannot pair them to all the cases. So yes, they go without 
kind of having this special person that can be there in their life. And is there a way you can? Yeah. Is there a way you can quantify the success of CASA and show that that this is really working? And and is there any data that does that? Yeah, this is a great thing. This is one of the things I love about being um, a leader at this nonprofit in this community because we're backed by a national organization, the National CASA Association. There are 1,000 CASA programs in 47 states, and uh, they collect data um, every every month on our numbers. Uh, We share a data system uh, with other CASAs throughout the country. And so what we know is that um, if a volunteer, if a child has a CASA, they do better in school. Uh, We actually have an education advocate, a staff person who liaisons with the school. So our kids do better in school, which is key. They have fewer placements, meaning they're bounced around less, which is good and saves the state money. And they find permanency faster. So they have a squeaky wheel behind them that says, let's get going and let's make this happen. So they find permanency faster. So instead of two and a half years, maybe with a cost of 18 months. And this is the great thing. They stay in that placement. They're not coming back into foster care. You know, so that that placement works for that child more often if that case has a CASA. Michelle, about a minute left. What can we do to help you and CASA of the Eastern Panhandle? Oh, thanks for asking, Rob. Well, I encourage people to go to www.mycasaep.org and learn more about us. Uh, You could do three things, Uh, volunteer, donate, or recruit. If you have a neighbor who would make a CASA volunteer, let them know about us. Uh, John, you mentioned 20th anniversary. I'm glad you've been there for 20 years. You were there in 20, 2003 when CASA started. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary. We have our gala on July 29th. So please buy tickets to the gala. Sponsor us. We need all the support we can. Yeah. Where is the gala? Um, it is going to be at the McMurrin Farm in Shepherdstown. Six o'clock. It's a garden gala. John, you have to put on your flowered hat and uh, no. wear your garden I will be there, but no flowered hat. Sucker <laughs> <laughs> sucker for you. I would like to see the flowered hat, John. <laughs> I have no flowered hat. Michelle, can we get John a flowered hat? John will not accept a flowered hat. <laughs> How about a, f- a flowered fedora? How's that? Uh, no. Still no. No, I'm, I'm not getting the budge. Michelle, but I'll be there. Michelle, thank you so much. I appreciate your time this morning. Have a great day.